So my talk today is not going to be telling you things about AI or machine learning. Um, and if you'd like to talk about those things, I would be delighted, though. Uh, my talk today is supposed to tell you how to live your life um, and be very inspiring and motivational, which is super strange to me. Like, every other talk I've ever given in my entire life has been technical. So if, if this doesn't hit you in your feels, uh, let me know, and, and we, can, we can make modifications, or I can just go back to talking about machine learning, and that would be fine, too. So who am I? I am Paige Bailey. I make things with computers. Um, I am also a cloud developer advocate for Microsoft, specializing in machine learning and AI. Um, I recently started with Microsoft, uh, just got my first product badge, so we had a product launch, and that was exciting. Um, but before that, I was a data scientist in the energy industry for about four and a half years. Um, I was a geophysicist by kind of trade and educational background, learned a lot of things about applied math and computers, um, started building geophysical plugins, and then when they found out that what I was doing is data science, they decided to call me that. So that's, that's kind of the career trajectory. Um, 10 years experience with Python thereabouts, mostly because it was the only way I could get ArcGIS to make maps without crashing. Um, and then four years also with R, because that's what Chevron used for most machine learning. So that's technical background. Again, this talk has nothing to do with that. So today, we, um, we are in Austin. Austin is home. Um, and I moved to Austin August 14th. So that's when I decided to start working for Microsoft or I was, I was lucky enough to, to get hired by Microsoft. And prior to that, I was living in a place just to the east called Houston, Houston's home. Um, lived there for about eight years. Uh, loved it. Uh, went there for undergrad and stayed around for grad school and for work. And it was absolutely a delight to live there. So August 14th. August 14th. What was happening around August 14th? Well, um, there was a big honking storm um, that hit Houston about two weeks after I moved, uh, which was perfect timing, you know, like abs absolutely, I, I made correct life decisions. But, um, but what this actually did was it deposited 41.66 inches of rain on average across the entire Houston metropolitan area. And so what does that actually look like? That looks uh, stuff like that and, and like that. So, so you ended up with some areas with very little rainfall and some with like catastrophic amounts of flooding, places that you wouldn't even recognize, right? And houses that had never flooded before, weren't even listed on a floodplain suddenly underwater. Um, that's uh, very close to where I used to work. And so you end up with these situations where apartment buildings, entire homes are kind of placed underwater. That's my old apartment complex. So very glad I moved. Um, and, and also uh, that's a coworker, um, Lucas, lifting his son Jacob into a boat um, that, you know, and kind of waist high water. It's just a little bit absurd. So what, what Houston realized whenever this storm hit, and I'm sure you guys remember it, most of you are from Texas, right? Like, show of hands. So pretty much everybody, awesome. So most people, um, most people realized that it hit kind of quick. Like, the, the weather reports were mostly like, oh, it's going to do this thing, and then it's going to go over there, and it's just not a problem. Nobody worry. And then about two days ahead of time, they were just like, oh, shnikes. Like, it is going to be much more devastating than we actually thought. Um, everybody, uh, everybody kind of hunkered down. This is going to be a situation. And they also realized about that time that um, the entirety of Houston Fire Department, Police Department, everyone had six boats. So six boats for the entire Houston area, the entire populace. People underwater in their homes you know, on the second floor, completely stranded without a boat, um, and only six available. Lots of people not really knowing where to go and get food. Lots of people not knowing how to help if they had food or had space to give to folks. Um, and, and lots and lots of confusion, primarily based on, you know, they were, everybody was completely underprepared. 
so at this point, um, everybody kind of realized um, collectively that no one was going to come help. No one was able to come help. And it was it was kind of up to Houston itself if they wanted to build out an infrastructure to, um, to sort of assist people who are in need. So you see here... Um, Jeff, um, Jeff Reichman and Sketch City Houston kind of architecting out a solution for building a website. So having a standard blog, um, blog spotty uh, sort of website where people could come in, fill out information about what they needed um, or where they were located, whether or not they needed to be rescued, how many folks that they had available. Um, so again, just very simplistic, right? Like a SQL da SQLite database on the back end and just like this um, completely form entry website on the front end. Um, and it helped a ton. So everybody was able to log in um, or to just say like, hello, you know, here's a phone number. Um, I live at this location. Like, please dispatch someone immediately um, for to go and help. If someone had a boat, they could list it as, as a, a, you know, transportation mechanism that could be in then requested by the police or by the fire department, um, and they could come in and, and make that modification. So why is that important? First of all, all of these things were open sourced, right? So, and they were just people kind of getting together in a community led effort to build a website or build a framework for these rescue crews to come and operate. And in the next few days, um, it ended up being incredibly important. So we had Harvey. Harvey stuck around for a while. And then we had Irma, which hit landfall as one of the most catastrophic floods um, that the United States has ever seen. And again, since all of this information was open sourced, um, they could just take that website, hook it up to the data that Florida already had, and they actually ended up using a number of Houston solutions to, um, to assist people in Florida after the hurricane hit. So does this get done often? Like that, you, you could think, okay, well, this is an isolated event. You know, how often are these climate events going to happen? Like, uh, obviously, you know, this was just kind of a one-off instance. Would it, would it ever be useful ever again? And there was also something um, fairly recently called the San Jose flood bot. So towards the beginning of the year, not, not around the Harvey time, um, San Jose experienced really strange flooding for San Jose. Um, and, you know, Bay Area being the Bay Area, they decided to build out a chat bot for this. So people kind of had the same situation. They would go in, they would use the chat bot, they would say, hey, so tell me what the flooding is like at this, um, at this particular location or give me a safe route to here from here. Um, that sort of thing. So a guy who um, is a coworker of mine, Paul DiCarlo, built uh, built a similar bot. Just kind of you know decided to fork the repo and make it Houston specific. So adding support for Chinese, adding support for Spanish, um, and then making uh, making a very similar disaster recovery bot for Houston. This bot has since been incorporated um, by Houston into its Houston 311 program. So being able to being able to take an application that was just kind of you know created in a spur of the moment need to be there uh, need to be there extent and actually productionalizing it operationalizing it making it something that a city would want to use and to incorporate into their program so kept coming uh, Hurricane Katia Hurricane Irma Hurricane Jose hit Puerto Rico obviously. And then Hurricane Nate spinning around Mexico. So this, this situation, this climate situation, I know that we had um, an abnormal number of hurricanes hit this particular year. Um, but every indicator is telling us that it's only going to keep getting worse. So if you... If you haven't read this, I, I sincerely recommend that you do. It's written by a guy named Brett Victor, who also created Al Gore's, Al Gore's iPad notebook about climate change and about how you could assist with it. Um, but, but what I want you to focus on is, is this line down here. So how do you think the tech community can contribute to tech and or policy solutions on a global scale? 
And I'm talking today about climate change, but this can really be applied to any sort of industry that you're interested in. So we see random acts of kindness, and, and that's mostly into three different buckets, I would feel. So if you're passionate about policy, if you care, um, you might want to take a look at some of these websites. So data.gov, data.texas.gov, all of these open data initiatives. And Texas is extremely fortunate in that the te Texas Department of Information Resources has kind of open sourced a number of data sets and standardized them across cities. So you're no longer having to go to like open data Austin and open data Houston and open data Dallas and hoping that whatever you're looking for from a GIS perspective or a CSV file for financial data is existent in all of them. Um, they're standardized into one Texas open data portal um, and that makes it uh, much easier for a developer. Um, they're also kept up to date and they're funded through the state government, which is wonderful. Um, part of the reason why we were able to build applications for Houston that had routing and had these GIS implications was because open data was a thing, right? Like not all states are this fortunate. And as the United States at kind of a, a massive governmental level, you know, puts less and less of a focus on open data, um, it's more and more important for cities, for communities, and for states to be, um, to be enforcing of, of open data initiatives. You can also give your time. So if you're an engineer who actually understands people problems, um, there are few of you, few of us, I hope, um, I hope I understand people problems. And there are a number of organizations who are looking for people just like you. So um, Code for America, Data Kind, Data for Democracy, um, those are more on the data science focused areas um, because those are just what the ones that I know the most about. Um, later this year as, as part of Pi Data, I'm speaking, um, I'm, I'm kind of speaking as a representative for ethical algorithms at an unconference, so uh, building out tools for developers and for machine learning engineers to use to take data sets and to make sure that any of the features included in those data sets wouldn't be leading to, um, to algorithmic choices that would be biased towards age or race or gender or something of that nature. So there are ways that you can attempt to feature engineer in an ethical way. Um, it's just a matter of actually, you know, kind of architecting out those solutions. So that's, that's some ways you could spend your time. There are also ideas always on Twitter. So Twitter is great for ideas, right? So a few there listed, um, we need an open source kit to detect and locate people alive under 20 meters of rubble. There are no such thing like that right now. And that would have helped a ton in the hurricanes. It would have helped a ton in Puerto Rico. Um, building an app like Gas Buddy for hurricane preparedness. Um, offline geotagging to res record disaster areas needing relief, like all of these things. Um, and they, they aren't necessarily all really, really intense engineering problems. They're mostly just a person building a simplistic web app on top of a SQLite database. Right. So it also doesn't matter if you're a Python developer. I assume most of us are. Um, it's any, really any tool, right? And, and there isn't just a need for developers, there are also designers and writers, which is extremely hard, and, and people who create visuals and um, sort of audio or vi video solutions. Any way that you can help would be useful to any of the organizations that I just mentioned. And from a funding perspective, um, I'm biased, so I'm fortunate, I'm fortunate to work at a company um, that gives money to climate data initiatives um, like just regardless of, um, regardless of purpose. So the Azure Climate Data Research Grant um, gives you basically unlimited compute time on Azure and unlimited storage capacity uh, if you're doing any sort of climate data research. So if you're at UT or if you're, you know, just working from a nonprofit, um, you can do, um, you can apply for a grant and get your entire research program funded, which is awesome. Um, there's uh, the thing that I'm showing right here is an example of a project that I'm doing with the Nature Conservancy that attempts to quantify um, quantify climate change impact on tourism dollars for United States and other countries. So what what we are doing there 
is they've scraped all of Flickr, Instagram, all those other things that the cool kids are using these days um, to pull images, to pull all those image files. They're all lat long coordinated or lat long coordinate referenced, I should say. So you pull out the ones that are listed in those countries. Um, you check to see with uh, sort of deep learning mechanisms. This is something from CNTK. Um, which ones are actually referring to people who are snorkeling or doing underwater sports, looking at reefs. Um, and all of those are kind of collected in a time series data set that show you how many people are built, um, visiting the countries, how often they're taking pictures, what kind of activities they're doing, and how that impacts climate, um, how that impacts the number of dollars that the, that the countries are accruing. Um, that can then be taken back to a government and said, okay, well, if our reefs are preferentially bleaching, um, then we're not going to have those tourists come in and this will be the impact to our finances. The nice thing too about um, sort of the deep learning mechanisms is that you can train on a particular invasive species, so like a lionfish, um, and then count how many times those are um, referenced in any of those corpus of images. And the images that we're searching through is about five million. So it, it's kind of nice to not have a poor, you know, intern, unpaid intern or grad student go through and look at every single one of those photos to pick out which one is a snorkeler or which one is a, which one is a fish. So this is a link to, um, to the presentation that you just saw. Um, I'm also available on Twitter if you if you have any sort of ideas, any sort of wants or concerns or desires to help with any of those organizations. Um, I have the most uh, the most experience with Code for America and Data for Democracy, um, and I'm also the Microsoft contact for the Climate Data Grant. So if any of your research um, if any of your research falls into that area, more than happy to assist. I've also included a list of um, list of extra materials. So if you if you'd like to take a look at those, um, and that's that's about it. So I hope you had a great Pi Texas. Um, I think I see some of the organizers in the back. So if you like, could we give them a round of applause? For doing great. Excellent. And if anybody has any questions, I think I've got 10 minutes left, but I'm probably all that's standing between you and like a beer or something. So, so I understand if you like push me out of the way to get to the door. Um, yes. Describing a situation where uh, things were kind of evolved spontaneously. Yes. Mm -hmm. What happened to all those prepared this? Uh, Logos that actually I know some software because faster to prepare this yeah. uh, writing to our time. Um, all of those initiatives didn't catch or so they Absolutely. So the disaster preparedness, um, disaster preparedness applications that are built by FEMA, that are built by a number of other organizations, um, sometimes they get throttled by bandwidth constraints. And then also um, a number of other efforts are just so specialized for a, partic a particular geographic location that it doesn't really make sense um, to use those applications. So an example would be the, the mud raking website, right? So like being able to say that you are available to help go clean out somebody's house, that's a little bit different than something that FEMA would describe. I will say this though, like the, the chat bot for the San Jose flood rescue, um, that was built um, from an FAQ on FEMA's website. So the, the chatbot, if you, if you ever want to make one, it is the, it is the most brain-bogglingly simple experience in the entire world. What you do, well, s seriously. Like, so basically all you do is you, um, you have five lines of code and you point it at an FAQ on a website. So, so a website that's already had like a question and answer sort of situation architected out. Um, and the chatbot does a sort of keyword search through the question asking and the answers. Um, and so if you type in a, if you type in a question um, through natural language processing, it kind of understands what your intent is, your motivation for the question, 
and it gives you back a response there. So the websites that you're mentioning, they are incredibly useful in that they have a number of those FAQs available. They have a number of um, sort of here's what you should do if a hurricane happens sorts of things. But if, if, but if it's actually like getting people um, getting people kind of, um, you know, sort of enthused and excited and uh, motivated and organized into a collective mob that they can go and do good. Um, that's that's not what that's not what the the FEMA stuff was used for in Houston. And then also the reality that we only had six boats, right? So instead of having you know a fleet of things that we could dispatch to go and do our bidding. Um, it was like, okay, well, there's like 20 guys coming over from Louisiana and they've all got flat bottom boats and, you know, hopefully they'll help us go find some folks. So that sort of thing. Excellent. Thank you all for giving up your weekend for a Python conference. That's amazing. <laughs>